Okay, I guess we're getting started. Uh, welcome everyone, hi. Uh, welcome to the second rural conversation hosted by the National Rural Assembly and the Daily Yonder. My name is Ajayel Casaperalta and I'm your moderator um, for this conversation. Today, we continue our discussion about rural broadband in the time of COVID. Um, and today we'll hear from policy experts about what's being done to improve access for rural and native communities during this urgent moment. Um, what's being done by Congress and by the Federal Communications Commission and what are the local efforts that they're seeing. Uh, first, we will hear from panelists and then we will have an engaging conversation uh, where we will take your questions. So before we dive in into this great conversation we've prepared for you today, uh, we're going to do a few housekeeping items. Um, and I'm going to, oh yeah, share my screen with everyone. Let's see. Share, so that should share it, good. <laughs> Adventures in technology. Um, and now I just have to do a view that is actually slideshow. There you go. Ah, well, you get the presenter view. Um, so a few housekeeping items. Uh, so first you're watching via YouTube. Um, and uh, you'll continue watching Rural Conversations via YouTube as well, via the Daily Yonder YouTube page. Um, you can send questions uh, via the YouTube comments and you do need a YouTube login to be able to do that. Um, or you can also send us questions via Twitter using the hashtag Rural Conversations. Um, you, we also wanna hear what's happening in your communities. Um, and to do that, we'd like to, for you to use the hashtags Rural Broadband and COVID-19. We wanna know what solutions you are seeing in your communities, what challenges you're seeing to access uh, internet service in rural and native communities. Um, because some people, uh, you know, we know that some folk don't have access to uh, brats um, to live stream this uh, conversation. We will make the recording available tomorrow um, on the Rural Assembly website. And we also want to remind you that the Rural Assembly, uh, the Rural Assembly has a COVID-19 resource page with lots of great information about um, uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, and its impact on rural communities and resources. And finally, there's a rural conversation survey that we'd love for you to take, um, uh, take a few moments to answer. Uh, we want to learn what other topics you like to discuss in conversations like this one. Um, and I'll stop sharing this now. Great. So um, now we're just going to go back uh, to our conversation that we have prepared um, and to dive in, um, you know, to give a little background first. Uh, so the COVID-19 pandemic uh, required all of us to continue our lives uh, from home, um, you know, to telework, to uh, distance learn, and to obtain healthcare from our home. And in order to do that, uh, we need internet service, we need broadband service. Uh, but as you've noticed, millions of people in the US do not have access to broadband. Last week, we heard from panelists about how the lack of internet service is affecting rural and native communities, particularly during this uh, pandemic. Uh, and this week, we will focus on solutions. Um, we will discuss what Congress and the Federal Communications Commission have done to increase broadband access in response to the, to the pandemic um, and what rural and native communities can do in the immediate, in the medium, and in the long term to ensure that internet access is available in their communities. Uh, joining us in this conversation today, we have a great uh, group of panelists. We'll have uh, Roberto Gallardo, who's the Assistant Director for the Center uh, for Regional Development at Purdue University. We also have Jenna Leventoff, uh, Senior Policy Counsel at Public Knowledge. Uh, we'll hear from Loris Taylor, CEO of Native Public Media, and Irene Flannery, Director of Amarind Critical Infrastructure. And we will also hear from Beth O'Connor, Executive Director of the Virginia Rural Health Association. And again, I'm Ajayel Casaperalta. I'm an attorney that serves uh, underrepresented communities in telecommunications matters, and I'm based in Denver. 
Um, so now, without further ado, to hear from our panelists. So Mr. Gallardo, would you get us started? Sure, Yael. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? It's always good to double check. Uh, hello, fellow virtual panelists. Uh, I am here in this lovely Canadian background, but I am in the guest bedroom. I would like to talk to you about, to set the stage uh, for my colleagues to discuss the details of policies, um, uh, some of the research that we've done that looks into rural and uh, how it's impacting this, uh, you know, thanks in part to this COVID situation. It is really shedding a very bright spotlight into this issue that we have been uh, kind of uh, talking about for a while, at least those of us in my professional circle in the rural assembly and others, uh, that the connectivity is not where it needs to be at, and from the rural side of things. Um, unfortunately, this is our test and I'm afraid we're not gonna do very well. And so I will, I will share with you some of the research we've done and some stats and a database that we developed to help communities better understand what it is they're facing when it comes to mitigation strategies uh, regarding COVID-19. Uh, to begin with, let me start to, uh, by saying that uh, broadband infrastructure, uh, the data around this is a very um, interesting because the only national data set we have is the FCC Form 477. And before you throw uh, tomatoes to your uh, uh, computer screen, I'm the only the messenger, uh, but it's, uh, it's the only thing we have. So I'm gonna cite a couple of those. Keep in mind it overestimates coverage, uh, but still it's important because it jumpstarts conversations that otherwise would be hard to kind of initiate. So that's kind of what, what helps uh, tremendously in that respect. So broadband infrastructure has been built. I'm gonna talk about between 2014 and 2018. Uh, the trends are encouraging in a way where broadband in rural areas has been increasing. Let me, I'm going to look upward here a little bit to my other screen. However, there is a concept that again is being kind of shown clearly today because of COVID, there is not digital parity. And with digital parity, we refer to uh, same level of connectivity between urban and rural. Uh, that that needs to be uh, a playing level field, level, uh, a level playing field, and it's not the case. So uh, let me show, for example, that um, for example, while less than two percent of housing units in urban uh, areas had access to only one provider, a third of rural housing units had access to only one provider. So that's a huge discrepancy there. For example, that clearly highlights the lack of digital parity. Um, what's really interesting is, for example, uh, in 2014, one quarter of housing units in urban areas had access to fiber. That number jumped to almost 50% by 2018. Uh, uh, in contrast, rural housing units, 10% had access in 2014, and uh, by 2018, it was only 17.6%. So there are being investments done. Uh, but the, the level is really not where it needs to be, which brings me to my next point, which is the COVID situation. We developed a map uh, that you can go and see at the census tract level. We identified those communities that are more vulnerable to not implementing mitigation strategies like e-learning and remote work. Uh, how did we calculate that? We looked at connectivity issues, but also at the percent of the workforce that is uh, employed and works and in, in jobs that are not remote work friendly and guess what two thirds of counties that are in the high vulnerable uh, category are rural counties. Uh, so there's a lot to be done. That's the context we're facing. I get uh, uh, calls from um, superintendents. Uh, you know, I saw, I know you discussed schools in your last uh, video um, panel, but it's, it's, a, it's a situation that unfortunately has caught rural with the short end of the stick. Thank you for uh, setting that context for us, uh, Roberto. And um, I will sneak a little bit of info while uh, um, we prepare for the next panelist. Um, I want to pick up um, and introduce the conversation we'll have uh, with a little bit of background on some of the programs that are designed to address um, this gap in uh, connectivity that Roberto just um, um, you know, told us about. So let me 
share uh, my screen again. Uh, uh, let's see. Great. So as, as Roberto was saying, there are, um, you know, there's always existed this uh, lack of parity in telecommunications access between rural and urban areas. And from the beginning of um, uh, our communications uh, um, federal laws uh, in 1934, uh, the FCC was created precisely to address uh, lack of access in more rural and remote areas. And so we um, embraced this principle called universal service, the idea that all Americans would have access to uh, telecommunications, well, communication services. And so in 1996, we formalized this, um, uh, this principle and created the universal service fund um, to fund uh, how we would deploy universal service uh, to everyone in the United States. So there are four programs that the FCC relies on and that our government relies on to make sure that the digital divide is closed. Um, and those programs are the Lifeline program, E-rate, rural healthcare, and high cost. And uh, the panelists will go into uh, more detail about these programs, but I just want to give a little bit of info. Uh, Lifeline uh, helps qualifying low-income consumers pay for uh, phone and internet service. E-rate funds internet access um, in uh, schools and libraries. Rural healthcare uh, funds voice and broadband service for healthcare uh, facilities in rural areas. And the high cost uh, program, um, it's a group of 11 separate funds that subsidize uh, telecommunications companies or eligible telecommunications carriers um, to offer phone and broadband service in rural areas. So these are the main ways in which the, uh, you, the FCC um, and the federal government uh, try to close the digital divide. Um, and before we go on to Jenna, who's going to talk to us about Congress, uh, congressional action in response to COVID and broadband, I did want to mention a little bit of what the FCC is doing in response to COVID. So I've highlighted a few actions that the FCC has taken since the pandemic started. Um, the main one being that the FCC launched the Keep Americans Connected pledge. Um, in which for 60 days, uh, beginning in middle of March around there, um, companies, uh, telecommunications providers said, um, agreed to not terminate service to residents or businesses uh, because they couldn't pay. Um, they also agreed that they would waive any late fees that a resident or a business um, accrued um, as a result of COVID and that they would open their, uh, their Wi-Fi hotspots to um, any American who needs them. Um, so these are some of the actions that the FCC has taken. The FCC has also waived uh, some rules from the Lifeline and the E-rate program. Uh, the FCC has also granted emergency access to Spectrum for some providers to provide emergency service. And the FCC launched a COVID-19 telehealth program that Beth, uh, one of our panelists, will also discuss. So I wanted to offer this as a background um, of what the FCC has done uh, before COVID to close the digital divide and now during the pandemic um, in response to the lack of telecommunication services in some areas. But now we'll go to uh, Jenna who will talk to us about what Congress has done. Jenna? Yeah, yes, um, thanks so much. Also, I'll just give a advanced apology if my cat makes her way into the video, she just, always always wants to be a part of any Zoom meeting that I'm in. Um, so um, my name is Jenna Leventhoff. I'm a senior policy counsel at Public Knowledge. And for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a DC-based advocacy group and we promote freedom of expression, open internet, um, as well as access to affordable communications tools and really work hard to shape policy on behalf of consumers and the public interest. So with that goal in mind, we've been following what Congress has been doing on COVID and broadband really closely um, and have been involved in a lot of those conversations. So the update about what funding for rural broadband has been included in legislation responding to the pandemic. Um, so Congress has passed right now three coronavirus stimulus packages. Um, and the third one was the CARES Act. And that's the only one that actually addressed rural broadband at all. Um, that said, it did relatively little to address rural broadband. Um, 
It completely disregarded broadband subsidies for low-income Americans. It provided, uh, you know, a pittance to deploy broadband where there isn't any, it didn't include requirements for broadband providers to drop data caps or stop charging overage fees um, to stop throttling. A few, yep, see the cat. Um, she's not going to let me do anything <laughs> um, to stop <laughs> throttling any, any sort of stuff like that, that makes sure that broadband quality <laughs> is sufficient. <laughs> um, oh my is God. your cat acting like Congress right now? Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, you know, Congress, what they did so far isn't enough. Um, but I will still go over what it did do. It did four primary things um, that are tangentially related to getting rural Americans connected. Um, and public knowledge would say that it's really important that Congress does more in forthcoming stimulus packages. So the first thing was Congress provided $100 million to the USDA for its reconnect program. Um, so that's an already existing program. It helps fund broadband deployment in rural areas. Um, you know, it works sort of alongside FCC programs that do the same thing. I will note though, you know, this $100 million deployment for broadband takes time. It's going to require oftentimes build out of new infrastructure. Um, and so it's one of those things where these funds aren't necessarily going to get rural Americans connected during the peak of the crisis. I also just want to note in terms of amounts, the FCC is actually said in the past that it's going to take about $80 billion to connect everyone in the country. Um, so this $100 million is just a really small fraction of that. Um, so the next thing that the CARES Act did, it provided $200 million to the FCC to support telehealth, which um, I think other panelists are going to talk about, but that money is being used right now to help healthcare providers fund their telecommunication services and offer telehealth options. Um, the bill also included $50 million in grants to the Institute of Museum and Library Services, um, in part that can be used to purchase internet accessible devices and provide support in connecting to the internet for those that don't sort of have the technical know-how to do that. Again, pretty small pool of money there. Um, and then one of the final things that it did was it allotted about $30 billion to states and that money can be used by schools for a whole long list of purposes, one of which is to support online learning. Um, so, you know, in theory, that money can be used to help students get connected um, or to get devices. But again, it's worth noting, there's really no guarantee that the money is going to be used for that purpose. It's one of many options. Um, and it's kind of up to individual states as to how it's spent. So, you know, not a lot has happened so far. There's more proposals that are in the works. Um, you know, I think a lot of folks on Capitol Hill are thinking that maybe in a fourth stimulus package, um, and just for terminology, um, a lot of you might be reading the news and seeing that there's something that Congress is discussing right now. We're calling that COVID 3.5. Um, it's a sort of interim COVID package, but an actual fourth or fifth package. Um, there are some proposals that are floating around. In particular, Congress is discussing about a billion dollars that would expand the Lifeline program that IDL described earlier. Um, it would provide subsidies to low-income Americans, and that subsidy would be more than the typical amount of Lifeline subsidies. Typically, that amount is $9.25. Um, this package have, would have a range of tiers depending on the speed available um, and would actually uh, possibly, um, you know, I think there's also provisions for maybe giving more money to tribal folks um, for connections. Um, also, Congresswoman Grace Meng, she's introduced a bill that would provide $2 billion for the E-rate program. Um, and that would allow schools and libraries to purchase hotspots to connect students and community members. That was introduced yesterday. Um, and we anticipate that the Senate will introduce companion legislation soon. Um, also, Senator Klobuchar, she has a $2 billion proposal that would give funding to, um, to small carriers um to support them offering free and discounted internet to their subscribers so i think a lot of um small internet providers are concerned that their customers can no longer pay them and this bill was intended to help those small providers stay afloat during the covid crisis and ensure that there's more competition in the marketplace um so all of that said i mean at the moment there aren't really any proposals for larger packages that are going to make huge dent in deploying broadband to the areas that need it, particularly in the short term crisis where people are forced to stay at home and have their cats on their Zoom videos. Um, so, you know, it's a tricky issue, I think, because deployment's a longer term thing, 
right? You know, hotspots can be deployed relatively quickly. Um, there's some discussion in DC circles about using school and library connections as sort of backhaul to offer community members internet. Um, and that could be done maybe a little bit faster, but in general, you know, it's hard to know what we can do to get people connected now. And so, you know, this issue is almost more than just a short term stimulus thing. It's certainly part of that. And we need to do more to make sure that Americans are connected for that. Um, but we don't want to be in a place should the next pandemic come that, you know, there's still millions of people out there that don't have connections to broadband. Um, and so I hope moving forward, whether it's in a COVID package or or not, that Congress is going to prioritize funding for broadband access and affordability. So, you know, I'm happy to answer more questions about that um, in a Q&A. But that's the general gist of, of what's been happening in Congress. Thanks, Jenna. And uh, with this background that both Roberto and Jenna have provided, um, Loris, can you uh, expand a little bit on what's going on in Native communities, what you're seeing? Um, so take it away while I set up your, uh, your slide. Good afternoon. I'm Lori Taylor. I'm the president and CEO of Native Public Media. I've been with the organization since 2004. We basically have two programs. One is to um, make sure that we secure broadcast licenses for tribes and uh, tribal entities. And once we get those stations on air to keep them on air. And secondly, we have a very robust national and international uh, communications and telecommunications policy program. <clears throat> so a little bit about native public media. We have uh, 59 radio stations licensed to local tribal governments and tribal entities and three television stations in the NPM family. We do everything, AM, FM, full power, low power, non-commercial, educational and commercial stations and on analog and digital platforms. And in 2016, Native Public Media published an emergency communications preparedness curriculum. And we hosted our training like two years before COVID-19. Who knew that this would come into play? And one of the things that we've learned throughout that process was that our Native stations are not just essential, they're classified as members of the first responder community. So if you can imagine, we've been just 24 seven working over time uh, the last few weeks. Um, one of the things that they do learn uh, from this uh, preparedness, communications preparedness training is to make sure that one, they know how to analyze the hazard. Secondly, that they can do a community scan, super important. Uh, learning where people live, uh, whether they have telephone, whether they have the internet, whether their street is unpaved or whether their streets even have a name. I come from a village of 100 people and none of the streets in where I live are, are have names. Uh, so also the other thing they've learned to do is to map vulnerable populations. We all know that when a disaster is occurring, uh, it doesn't come in an orderly package. It's quite the opposite. It's disorderly, there's chaos involved, and this is where good training comes into play. So we've been using Spectrum uh, to, uh, to uh, bring broadcast uh, facilities to Indian country for a very, very long time, but it's not enough. We have 578 American Indian tribes and Alaska native villages in the United States. And so even having 59 radio stations and several television stations, it's, it's just, it's not enough to provide the information in an information centric disaster and crises. And every disaster is just like this. Let me tell you a little bit about what's happening in terms of uh, COVID-19 across Indian country. Uh, as of yesterday for the Navajo Nation, which is one of the largest tribes in the United States, uh, they reported 1,321 positive cases and 43 deaths. And comparatively to other states, they're up there in the top five. Uh, 
uh, which is not good for, for Indian country. Zia Pueblo in New Mexico, which is one of our smaller tribes with a population of 900, reported 31 positive cases. And there's a real fear among Native Americans that some tribes could become extinct due to COVID-19. I I, I'm praying and hoping that that's not even possible, but the reality is that health is very slow in getting out to Indian country, which is very remote and isolated in many places. In Arizona, 62% of all the positive cases are tribal. Um, and according to Indian country today, 50 billion in economic activity will be lost in Indian country because of COVID-19. So one thing that we know for sure is that people are dying and they're suffering physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And where infrastructure is limited, the anxiety is even more pronounced. Uh, we normally refer to these areas as news deserts and zero gig communities. That's Indian country. It's like we're the poster children of not being connected. Um, so a little bit about what our broadcast facilities are covering right now in the absence of broadband and internet connectivity. So um, we're basically really focused on four areas of information. We're looking at inf information from hospitals, from law enforcement, from hazard management, and from government. So for example, uh, we know that hospitals serving reservations have set up specific protocols for testing as well as for how patients can be seen. Uh, we're uh, spreading this information over our airwaves. Super important for people that may not even have a telephone uh, radio is one way to get into these homes. We're also covering government directives. You may not know, but the Navajo Nation has implemented a 57 hour weekend curfew that starts at 5 p.m. on Friday and ends on Monday at 6 a.m. And there are, are citations and fines attached to this curfew. And for me as a Hopi Nation person, our reservation is in the middle of the Navajo reservation. So there's a lot of intergovernmental activity as well that is being broadcast over the airwaves. So that as a Hopi person, if I'm traveling from Hopi uh, through the Navajo uh, reservation, I have to be aware that there's a curfew in place, have my tribal ID on my person so that if I'm stopped, I can say that I'm not a member of the Navajo Nation. I'm a Hopi Nation person traveling through. Um, then there are, uh, of course, other directives that we're all familiar with. But the latest one that we're covering now is regarding hazard management. As we're transitioning loved ones um, into their journey, uh, those that have left us, uh, we're learning about new protocols in terms of handling infectious bodies. And so uh, this has got huge cultural uh, relevance to Native Americans. So that kind of information, very delicate, is being uh, broadcast over our airwaves. And then of course, the big one, uh, where to get groceries, right? If you're an hour and, a, and up to two hours away from the nearest grocery store, you want to know whether you should get in your car, travel those two hours and, and get to the nearest town and make sure that those items are going to be available. Uh, we're finding that many times the shelves are already empty. And so there's been a lot of bulk buying happening uh, by people like myself hauling groceries out to the rural community so the elders uh, have food and the necessities that they need. Uh, so one thing that's quite apparent is that we're wired to be connected to other human beings, to our environment, to the world. And so uh, let me just uh, uh, transition over to what's happening from Native public media in terms of our policy. We know that in, uh, in, in Americans, uh, in this, in this uh, focus on getting Americans connected, Northern Arizona University in Arizona, for example, has set up a parking lot hotspot across tribal communities. On the Hopi reservation, we're lucky to have one. Um, my grandson uh, who used it the other day uh, experienced some high latency issue. 
adults. Um, also, they only had one mobile handheld, so he did his homework and then his sister followed. And that that's like four hours right there for the parent to be in some parking lot with their kids. Not very ideal. Um, so recently, we've urged the FCC um, to do a few things, and I'll try to cover this very quickly. We've encouraged, uh, we've asked the FCC to encourage internet service providers to offer subsidized or free broadband to native radio and television stations to tribal governments, first responders and hospitals on reservations. We've asked them to increase broadband speeds and, and provide unlimited voice calling and text messaging for our Lifeline customers. Uh, you may not know, but the subsidy that uh, Native Americans used to receive from Lifeline was lower uh, we're now asking them to go back the other way, ramp it up. We're asking for a suspension of all fixed and mobile broadband data caps and usage overage charges. And we're asking them to deploy more spectrum. Uh, right now, the 2.5 gigahertz window is open for tribes. But here's the thing, tribal governments are shut down. Only the essential departments are in service. And so we've also asked from Native Public Media for the FCC to extend that window for another 12 months. Um, and Loris, um, can we uh, can, can come back to these amazing recommendations when we okay. do the broader discussion? Absolutely. Let me just end by saying that, uh, just one more thing, Chairman Pai, uh, temporarily granted the use of 2.5 gigahertz to the Navajo Nation. We're asking them to uh, make this available to other tribes. And with that, uh, with a quick wrap up, thank you so much. Thank you, Loris. Um, and I think this is a great uh, conversation about what can we done that will uh, keep going back with everyone as well. And thank you for starting us off with some of the amazing recommendations here. And now we want to hear from Irene um, Flannery. Uh, Irene, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing uh, with uh, native uh, with tribes and native communities and E-rate? Sure. Um, hi, it's Irene Flannery. Um, I am the director of Amarind Critical Infrastructure. Um, Amarind is a, uh, a household name in Indian country. Uh, the company has been in existence since 1986 and was created um, to address the challenge that um, tribal members were having in, in obtaining insurance for their housing. Um, so uh, if you think of Amerind, it's um, if you think of American Indian, that's how the name was created. Uh, we are owned by 400 member tribes. Um, and at its core, Amerind is an insurance company. We're 100% tribally owned. Uh, we started out in the housing on the housing side, and that's still a core part of our business, but have expanded for the most part in the insurance realm. But about four years ago, um, the board, uh, Amerind's board was looking at ways to give back to our members. Um, and looked at a number of, of different critical infrastructures, including energy, uh, roads, and broadband, and decided that broadband really was uh, the 21st century critical infrastructure. So they created a division, uh, Ameren Critical Infrastructure, um, and uh, two of us at, uh, at Ameren came from the Federal Communications Commission, uh, Jeff Blackwell and myself. Um, I spent 14 years at the commission, uh, two different tours of duty. Uh, I had the honor of being on the original E-Rate team uh, back in 1996, there were two of us, um, that, uh, that wrote the rules for the commission. Um, and my last five years at the commission, when I went back, uh, I served as the founding deputy chief of the FCC's tribal office office, the Office of Native Affairs and Policy. In between there, I worked for USAC, uh, the Universal Service Administrative Company. Uh, they administer that uh, $11 billion a year um, program, series of programs that uh, Ed Yal did such a great job of introducing. So I'm going to focus on E-Rate, which is one of those four programs. E-Rate stands for Education Rate. It was one of the programs created as part of the 1996 Telecommunications Act and provides um, discounted uh, telecommunications, broadband, and used to be voice, no more voice, um, services to elementary and secondary schools and libraries. Um, it's a program that has, and, and the discounts range from 20% to 90%, so it was always intended to provide additional funding to those schools and libraries in economically challenged communities. 
Um, there is no special provision for tribal schools and libraries, unlike Lifeline, as Loris mentioned, uh, there is a tribal Lifeline program. Um, E-rate's been a great program um, over the last 22 years. It's dispersed upwards of $60 billion a year uh, to bring uh, broadband infrastructure to schools and libraries. But um, it's, it's a cumbersome program. Uh, it's done great things. It's made a lot of progress. But we still today here in, you know, in 2020 find um, tribal schools and libraries still behind the digital divide in spite of a $60, 60 billion um, infusion of federal money uh, to, to bring that level of connectivity to schools and libraries. It's getting better. Uh, we're working with a number of, um, of tribal communities and helping to bring in particular broadband um, fiber, broadband fiber infrastructure. Um, but it's time to take, and the commission as, as uh, Adyala mentioned, the SEC has, has taken some, um, uh, has, has taken some kind of remedial uh, measures um, in response to COVID, including extending the filing window uh, for the upcoming funding year for E-rate, which is great, um, and reiterating um, its policy, which has been in place for, for many, many years, but I think a lot of folks didn't quite understand that, um, to allow schools and libraries to permit the community to access their Wi-Fi signal. And that's great. That's, those are wonderful things, but we all know that in rural America and across Indian country, driving to the school, driving to the library, sitting in the parking lot um, is, is good if there's nothing else, but there's no reason it should be that way. There's no reason that um, folks living in Indian country and folks living in rural America have to leave their homes and sit in a car um, outside a school or a library in order to do the things that we take for granted, um, being able to do you know, homework from home. And so if there's a silver lining to all of this, I think maybe this crisis, this pandemic is bringing these issues to the, to the forefront and saying, look, there is no reason that people living in certain parts of our country are dealing with third world connectivity, essentially. It's time, in my mind, it's time for the commission to think big. And it's possible within their statutory authority to expand. We need to think about, E-rate is funding all of these networks and they're on 24 seven. They're on all the time. It doesn't matter once you've paid for that connectivity, it's gonna be on all the time. Why not take bigger steps to expand and leverage that connectivity directly to students at home? It can be done. It takes a lot of creative thinking uh, and the commission can either do it within their existing statutory authority or they can forbear um, from some of the congressional requirements. So. Thank you for giving us a little bit more info on E-rate, Irene, and um, what the FCC can do. We'll hope to get into more of that conversation, coupling it with what uh, Loris mentioned about the permissions that were granted to tribal colleges um, that are surely using E-rate funding. Um, so now, or maybe not. <laughs> no colleges, <laughs> tell us about that. <laughs> oh, that's true, it's K to 12. That's right, right. I was wrong. Oh. <laughs> um, but now I'd we'll, uh, like to hear from uh, Beth O'Connor, um, who will tell us a little bit about um, the telehealth uh, programs at the FCC. Sure, great, thanks. Um, so as a background, the Virginia Rural Health Association is a nonprofit advocacy organization working to improve health and health care for the 2.5 million people who call rural Virginia their home. Um, so previously, telehealth was primarily seen as a way to allow rural patients access to specialists in urban areas. A patient would come in to a rural hospital clinic and connect remotely with the specialist in the big urban center. But now with COVID, telehealth is being used for primary care visits. The patient can stay at home and connect to their primary care provider uh, via the internet. And that way we don't have the risk to the face-to-face -face interaction. Um, this has generated both a lot of interest in um, from patients and providers and a lot of confusion for those who have never used telehealth before. Uh, we had many patients and many providers saying, nope, I'm not interested in using that telehealth stuff. That's not for me. I wanna to talk to people face-to-face. -face. And now all of a sudden they're very interested in telehealth. And so we're having um, a lot of interest where it didn't exist before um, with mixed results. Um, 
so with that, um, you know, quite a few of the rural hospitals had been using telehealth previously, but this is something fairly new um, for our, our smaller entities. Um, just last week, CMS issued guidance for rural health clinics and community health centers on using telehealth. With those guidelines, providers are working to determine how to structure those remote visits in a manner that will still allow them to be reimbursed. Um, it used to be to be reimbursed, the patient had to come to the clinic or to the hospital and then connect remotely to that urban site. There was They weren't allowed to be paid via Medicaid or Medicare visiting the patient home that way. So trying to figure out how all of that works now. Um, in terms of funding to support telehealth implementation, uh, prior to COVID for several years, the FCC had the Universal Service Fund, um, which I think was referred to already a li little bit. Uh, one program under, that, under USF is the Healthcare Connect Fund. Um, this helps public and nonprofit healthcare providers pay for broadband upgrades. Um, under the program, healthcare entities would have internet service providers bid on service improvements such as laying fiber to a hospital or clinic, and then the funds would cover up to 65% of the cost of those service improvements. Um, a concern with that eligibility for the Healthcare Connect Fund is limited to public and nonprofit providers in rural communities. Um, there's a few limited exceptions for urban hospitals that are part of a healthcare system with rural hospital sites. Um, and there's also some very tiny ex exceptions for for-profit rural hospitals. Um, but the application process is extremely burdensome. And the first few years, there were funds that went unclaimed because the applicants were not able to wade through the process. Um, now, many healthcare providers have joined consortiums and they pay someone else to complete the paperwork on their behalf. Uh, the best example of this, the Indiana Rural Health Association has several full-time staff that all they do is fill out that Healthcare Connect Fund paperwork on behalf of their members. Um, so that was the existing program under FCC. Now with COVID, um, FCC has $200 million available to help hospitals and clinics to provide services to patients in their homes. Um, the use of the funds is limited, and I'm gonna quote here, purchase telecommunications, information services, and connected devices necessary to provide telehealth services to patients in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so this essentially limits the funds to three service, three purposes. Um, one is telecommunication services and broadband connectivity connectivity. So voice over IP, uh, your basic Verizon or whoever, uh, broadband bill, those types of things. Um, two, information services. So things like remote patient uh, monitoring platforms and services, store and forward services, such as transfer of patient images and data to review by a physician, and platforms and services to provide video uh, consultations such as software and other services to, to support the telehealth visits. And then the third purpose for the funds are connected devices and equipments, tablets, smartphones, other connected devices. Um, so for example, there are uh, broadband enabled blood pressure cuffs and broadband enabled pulse monitors and broadband enabled scales. You can step on a scale, have the device send the information directly to your physician. Um, and then things like telemedicine kiosks and carts for use, use in hospitals and clinics. Um, big limitation with those devices is they have to be used for that direct broadband connection. So you can't say, step on a scale, write the number down and call that number into your provider. It has to be that direct connection via broadband. Um, all of those services assume that the patient already has, well, and the clinic for that matter, has broadband connectivity. Uh, for someone like me who doesn't have broadband at home, I have a very, very poor cell phone service that works some days, it doesn't work other days. Um, I would not be able to use those services. So none of these funds can improve the service that already exists. It can just help people use those broadband services to be able to improve uh, visits remotely. Um, 
A few eligibility limitations that people need to be aware of with those funds. First of all, the funds, again, can only be accessed by public and nonprofit providers. Um, an independent rural health clinic or a for-profit rural hospital would not be able to use those funds. Um, and the other thing is the funds don't cover any personnel, IT, administrative training costs, anything like that, and really telehealth. So if your provider needs technical assistance to learn how to use um, your new equipment, if your uh, office staff need training on how to do billing and coding in terms of telehealth, if you need to bring in technical assistance, it won't cover any of that. It just covers the services and the equipment to use those services. Um, some other key points with the COVID funds. One is those funds are essentially first come first serve. I would encourage anybody if they're interested to get their application in yesterday because once it is gone, it is gone. And 200 million is not gonna go all that far. Um, there is no application deadline where they wait to, to get X number in and then see who deserves it the most. They're reviewing applications as they come in. Um, the other part you need to know is this is not limited to rural providers. A rural clinic or, or excuse me, an urban clinic or a neuro hospital that wanted to use the funds to say provide services to a low income community in their service area could do that. It's strictly whoever needs it and can get their application in fastest. Right. And I think that's um, that's a point I'd like uh, to now start talk, having a conversation with everyone about all of these programs, essentially, and the, um, you know, the response from federal policymakers um, and Congress about what to do during COVID. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Beth, for breaking down the telehealth program for us. Um, so a question to go back to everyone. Um, and feel free to chime in, you know, this portion of the webinar, we want it to be as a fluid conversation as, as it can be while we're all chiming in from our own homes. And a reminder to people listening in, if you want to send in your questions, um, use, uh, use the YouTube comments to send in your question, or via Twitter, you can also use the hashtag rural conversations. And we're monitoring the questions that are coming in. Um, and we've already gotten uh, a quite a few nuanced conversations about these programs. So before we go into the more nuanced conversations, uh, I mean questions, I wanted to ask everyone. So we've discussed Lifeline, E-Rate, uh, Telehealth. Um, Roberto talked to us about the disparity in uh, internet access in rural and urban communities. Um, so how can we improve these programs? Um, as you know, as, as Beth was wrapping up, she's saying this is not this telehealth program is not exclusive to rural. So how can we improve, uh, improve Lifeline, E-Rate, telehealth to ensure that rural communities and native communities are able to use these programs to connect um, those communities? And you guys can jump in, on, or I can call on anybody. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, obviously, if some of the funds, there was at least an earmark that a certain percentage went to rural communities, you know, maybe an equal percentage of the population of rural, I think that would be a start in the right direction. I would personally like to see more go to rural, but, you know, I'm biased. And I'm, I'm probably going to take a little bit of a different position, just taking it from the tribal perspective, um, because the... The FCC in recent years has tried to restrict um, some of the programs that benefit tribal communities to those tribal communities in areas that it deems to be rural. Um, the, the reality is that the federal government has a trust responsibility uh, with all tribal nations, not just with those tribal nations that happen to be located in rural areas, which of course many of them are. Um, but just um, it, obviously there are critical issues and, and access issues in, in many rural areas that maybe some urban areas don't, uh, don't experience. But as far as tribal nations are concerned, uh, the issue of access uh, and lack of access and lack of affordable um, access uh, exists whether a tribal nation is located in a rural area or, or an urban area. Um, so the, the, the FCC tried to restrict Lifeline, the Lifeline Tribal Lifeline Program to those uh, tribal communities in rural areas and was um, slapped down uh, by the courts. 
Um, and they're, they're now doing the same thing with, uh, with the 2.5 gigahertz uh, tribal priority window that is restricted only to uh, tribal nations that the FCC considers to be located in, in rural areas. And I think that's a missed opportunity, a, a big missed opportunity. And I think to Irene's point, we say in Indian country that often the cows have more rights than human beings. Um, oh, yeah. To make sure that we start with uh, policy making. First of all, we need to make the internet a utility. Uh, it has to be free and open and available to everyone, everywhere, every time. And I think COVID-19 is definitely pointing at that. The other thing that we need to do is take a look at the spectrum allocation. We are, we are part of the United States. Uh, we've been fighting for broadband deployment and, and greater penetration for as long as I can remember. Uh, it's time to make sure that uh, the 2.5 gigahertz window is open right now, but it's very narrow in who can apply for it. So through uh, the eligibility requirements, there are many tribes that are going to still be excluded, those that, that are close to urban centers. I mean, this is really calling for the rural of the most rural. Uh, it's a very tight circle. Uh, all of Indian country needs broadband. Uh, all of Indian country needs additional spectrum to do what they need to do. Everything ranging from tele telehealth to the new innovations that are taking place. We're not even participating because we're being excluded. Uh, I think the other is that we need to make sure that, that we are adhering to the letter of the law. Uh, Lifeline, the universal service reform uh, has to be universal and ubiquitous. That means that every single American in the US should have, have that right and that privilege. And finally, we need to make sure that there's investment. Uh, we can have good policy, we can have good programs and good ideas, but the policy, uh, the funding needs to be there so that the deployment actually takes place. I'm happy that we're having the hotspots initiated across uh, the country. It's very necessary right now, but it's a, it's a Band-Aid. It really is, it's gonna be there short term. It'll be lifted and it'll go away. Uh, the fact that the Navajo Nation is using 2.5 gigahertz right now to provide broadband, that's, that has to be made permanent. And so we're making permanent solutions. Uh, there's already an avenue for the FCC to work with tribes and that's through tribal consultation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Loris. And I want to pick up on two threads um, that you, both, all of you mentioned. So first, I know um, Lifeline. Um, Jenna, you had said that Congress um, is looking at some improving Lifeline proposals. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that could contribute? Yeah, so um, some things I'm not allowed to share yet. That's how Congress works. But um, it's what, okay, it's just us. But what I, <laughs> what I am, um, what I think has been made available to the public already is the lifeline proposal for COVID would have different tiers of access. So you could access lifeline at like a 25 through speed or at a 100 speed. And then the benefit would increase according with that speed. Um, and one of the bigger changes that it would make is it would get rid of the ETC process. Um, the eligible telecom carrier, at least for like this interim sort of broadband benefit so that individuals could use their lifeline benefit with a number of carriers and not just sort of the traditional ones that they've been using. Um, and I think the thinking behind that is that it makes it faster to help people get connected. So that's some of the changes that are being considered for future COVID stimulus packages. And also just I want to add on quickly to the last question, you know, dollars are great. And I think this was mentioned earlier. But without good data about where those dollars need to go, we can't make smart policy decisions. Um, you know, so Congress took action. They passed the Broadband Data Act this year, and that requires the FCC to collect better data than it has been. Um, we could do a whole separate webinar on the problems with, with the data that we have right now. Um, but you know, it would make data collection a little bit more granular would give us a better sense of where there is and isn't broadband, but there's still ways that the FCC can improve even upon, you know, what it's being told to do in the Broadband Data Act. Um, it's important that we start understanding the price that people are paying and know if people can afford broadband. It's important to start collecting data about outages and know if our networks are reliable. If you have service, but it goes out 
all the time. You know, it's, it's not serving anybody. Um, and so there's all sorts of other data points that we need to start collecting in order to start formulating better policies all around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And um, before we lose the thread on to that five, um, I do want us to ex explain a little bit more of what that means. Um, so currently the FCC has a um, has opened the window where rural tribal um, lands, uh, you know, where uh, licenses for 2.5 spectrum are available, uh, that are available over rural and tribal lands. Um, a tribe can come, uh, or a tribe or a, or a specific entity can come and claim that license. And that license will allow them to build internet, wireless internet networks. Um, and so that's the measure that both um, uh, Loris and Irene have discussed. And uh, tell us a little bit, Take us back a little bit as to why you're bringing that up right now, both Loris and Irene, if you can. Well, first of all, it's, it's an incredibly unique opportunity. Um, back my, my last time at the commission, I was there from 2008 to 2016. And uh, in, I believe it was 2011, the FCC adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking on expanding access to spectrum over tribal lands. That rulemaking proceeding is still open. Nothing has ever happened. Um, there were some very radical proposals and some more short-term proposals. But, but up until now, the commission really hasn't taken um, a position on expanding access to um, spectrum over tribal lands. So this opportunity is incredibly unique. The FCC doesn't, so usually just by way of background, the FCC auctions licenses for spectrum. They can go for tens of thousands of dollars. In this opportunity, the window was, is open for tribal nations to apply for the licenses that are available, the 2.5 gigahertz licenses that are available over their lands, if they're tribal and if they're rural, um, at no cost. The license will, is free. Now, of course, there are build out requirements and there, you know, you'll have to spend some money to, to build out a network. But the reality is this open, this window is open for a finite period of time. And as Laura said, extending the window is critically important. A number, um, a, a number of members of Congress have, have, um, have been making that pitch. Commissioner Rosenworcel has mentioned that as well. Um, in line with many of the other steps the FCC is taking to give folks a better, a better opportunity. Because if tribes don't, um, apply for these licenses, they're going to go to auction and somebody's going to pay a lot of money and it's not going to be a tribe. It's going to be a commercial provider that comes and probably doesn't provide a good quality of service. So it's both a unique opportunity. It's a business, you know, an economic development opportunity. It's a bankable asset and it'll, it will put in the control of a tribal nation, the build out of its own wireless network using the spectrum license. It's just a, a, a really unique opportunity and we don't know whether it will ever or in the foreseeable future come again. Thanks. And um, I want to open it. Um, I want to start uh, asking the questions that are coming in via social media for panelists. And one of them talking about, you know, what are the opportunities that are uh, right now available for um, projects that deploy, to deploy broadband in rural and native communities. So if you guys can chime in with examples of efforts that you've seen that um, have worked to build broadband in rural and native areas. So I think the first uh, clear examples are bringing broadband down into the Grand Canyon uh, Wallapai community with mural net. Uh, there's also a project in New Mexico uh, under Kimball Sikekwaptua where she is um, coordinating an effort between several tribes, which is not easy when you're working across jurisdictions. Uh, but what I can say is that there has to be more innovation like that uh, for first mile, middle mile, and last mile efforts. Um, and I think the ingenuity is already there. It's just that we need 
uh, the spectrum to be actually allocated. And to Irene's point, uh, the fact that tribal governments are operating on a very limited basis right now, it makes no sense to have the window for 2.5 gigahertz uh, to close on August 3rd, 2020. That's like tomorrow. Uh, there are a lot of things that tribes have to do internally to make sure that they qualify for that spectrum. And so adding an additional 12 months is where we need help and making sure that people that are our allies out there can um, perhaps uh, encourage uh, Congress and the FCC to make sure that that happens. Um, if I could just build on something that Laura said when um, it, uh, Kimball used to work for me. Um, so we worked on those, um, on two um, fiber networks, tribally owned fiber networks that are now up and running and operational using E-rate money. So each one, so there's a, a network that connects the Jemez and Zia Pueblos uh, here in New Mexico, and then uh, another separate network that connects four Pueblos going north, just north of, uh, of Albuquerque up to Santa Fe. So um, Santa, the Santa Ana Pueblo, San Felipe, Santo Domingo, and Cochiti. Uh, these were each uh, roughly $4 million projects, 95% of which was um, paid for by the E-rate program. Uh, there is another uh, Pueblo community that, that we are working with that just broke ground on a similar network uh, using over $2 million worth of, of, um, of E-rate money. And these are fiber networks. And this is fiber that the tribes own. They own, they own it, they operate it, and they can take steps to leverage that connectivity to their communities. Um, so E-rate's not the only vehicle, uh, but it's one that's there. It's, it's a lot of money. It's $4 billion a year. Um, and it's, they're subsidies. So they're not grants. They're not loans. There's nothing to pay back. Um, it's, it's a subsidy program. Uh, so for communities like the Pueblo communities that, uh, that Loris mentioned and that, that we've been working with and, and, and in conjunction with, with Kimball as well, and the efforts that the Santa Fe Indian School um, has been taking, um, all of this money is going into the infrastructure in the ground that tribal communities now own. And Irene, a follow-up question on E-Ray that somebody asked on uh, YouTube is, um, does E-Ray exclude preschools since it's K-12? That is a great question. Um, and it is a state-by-state -state, uh, determination. So in, uh, in the Communications Act, uh, Congress said, left it to the states to define elementary education. So in states where elementary education is defined at starting at pre-K, um, head starts and preschools are eligible. In states in which uh, elementary ed is defined as beginning at kindergarten, unfortunately, pre-K and head start programs are not eligible. Mm -hmm. There is a resource and I can, I can provide you that information, Ed Yal, and we can get it out. On USAC's website, they maintain a, a list state by state as to whether um, pre-K and in some states, uh, juvenile detention facilities are eligible oh, um, and some good. adult learning uh, facilities are also eligible. Yeah, uh, do send us that so we can share it with, um, with the audience and on the Rural Assembly website. Um, I wanna bring in a point that's been made um, earlier and bring in Roberto to discuss it. So we, we discussed that, you know, to really um, uh, deploy services where, um, in, in the most efficient manner um, and that actually connects rural communities, we wanna understand what's available, right? Whether, uh, where there is broadband service, which currently is defined, I think by 23 megabits um, up, no down and three megabits up. Um, and so Roberto, since you're our data guy in this, in this uh, conversation, what do you think the FCC needs to be doing to really understand the, access to broadband in rural native communities. What, what data uh, tips do you want to offer? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Jenna mentioned the, the, the improvement data uh, bill that passed earlier this year. That'll help. Uh, but it's still, it's a very interesting to me that it, we're in 2020 and we're still relying on a method to collect data that's um, kind of so, so 20th century. I think that uh, we could uh, attempt to do some sort of crowdsourcing. I think that uh, a lot of valuable data could be gathered that way. In my work at the local level, we have to do surveys. We have to do surveys with homes 
and cross check that with the what the FCC is telling you. Um, we also have found that access, uh, you know, it can be 25.3 or 10.1, however you define it, is there. It's it's the quality of that service, meaning do you get the speed and the broadband that you need for your particular, you know, whatever situation. Uh, we did a study in Indiana and we found 93% said, yeah, I have access. Two thirds of them, though, were not satisfied with that access. So there's a, a different level there. And that data, unfortunately, does not exist. As Jenna mentioned, cost. We don't know about cost and so the cost in, in urban in all areas really but mostly in urban inner city neighborhoods you know it's it's affordability um and so we, we're, we're we're flying in the dark so first and foremost let's let's uh try and gather uh try different methods more um uh 21st century methods to gather data perhaps and cross check what what already exists Excellent, thank you. And uh, we've actually get uh, receiving a lot of questions uh, that go uh, to whether there are efforts in other agencies beyond the FCC and USDA. Um, so somebody's asking, does the Department uh, uh, Forestry have any initiatives? Does the uh, Department of Interior have any initiatives that would support broadband deployment? Um, can you guys chime in with ideas about that? So the USDA actually has several sources of funding um, to support telehealth services and broadband connectivity. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't tried to go after those funds yet, so I don't know exactly how that works. Uh, but I believe that those are loan programs, but those loans can be forgiven. So I just want to add that for um, Indian country, uh, we submitted testimony from Native Public Media to the Senate Indian Affairs Committee asking that there be more interagency cooperation between the USDA, the FCC, the Department of Interior, uh, Indian Health Service. All these agencies have a role in, in how much uh, broadband can be connected to Indian country, but sometimes the dialogue is not there. They're, they're working in uh, isolation from one another. And we need, we need some sort of uh, national advisory that can direct this interagency inter cooperation because most times we're barking at the FCC, but we know that the answers are from the other departments as well. Great, and in, and in that spirit as well, we, we received a question talking about specific efforts uh, for cooperatives and municipalities. Um, and if there are challenges um, that those entities are facing to be able to meet um, you know, broadband deployment, um, do you guys have any ideas on, on that? Uh, well, oh. Ladies first, ladies first. Go ahead. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, so certainly uh, one partnership that I think people need to, to think about with the Healthcare Connect Fund, um, again, the, the funds will pay up to 65% of those service improvements. The other 35% can come from anywhere. Um, so, so for example, if a hospital wants to lay a trunk right to their front door in terms of fiber and the local chamber of commerce wants to be able to tap into that trunk or a local industrial site or a school or a library or whoever, and they want to pitch in that 35%, those have created some fabulous public-private partnerships because obviously paying 35% for a high-speed line into your community is a whole lot cheaper than the full cost. And Roberto, you were uh, chiming in, interested? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, uh, it's no news to anybody that's uh, watching us or in, in this panel, to truly ensure that our rural communities are, uh, have adequate broadband uh, will require all hands on deck. And uh, it, this, this takes in and of itself a tremendous amount of awareness and capacity building at the local level. And so we, we do not need to lose that because it is critical that everybody pitches in. Uh, it, this is not a one party solution situation. It is very complex and it'll, it'll require multiple technologies. It'll require multiple parties, whatever. It's all hands on deck. And, and, and that, that concept of all hands on deck may not be possible if the awareness is not there. 
And I think one other barrier to to point municipal guys like she is just loves the voices um you know another barrier is that a lot of states even though municipal broadband is a great way of getting broadband to places that otherwise wouldn't have it and making that broadband more affordable and increasing competition you know a lot of states have laws that you know either restrict or outright ban municipal broadband um and that's impeding ensuring excuse me that everyone has access to broadband so i think that's another important thing to consider yeah, thank you so much for bringing up that, um, uh, you know, that the fact that a lot of states don't allow um, municipalities or um, to chime in and to, you know, enhance competition uh, to internet access. And I think, um, you know, personally, I see the 2.5 window as, as one of those barriers that has been lifted for tribes to be able to build their own networks themselves. As Irene was mentioning, they don't, uh, now the tribal tribal entity that wants the license doesn't have to bid in a you know very expensive um, auction for the spectrum license and so I, I see it in relation to um, local efforts to be able to build their um, you know for localities for tribes to build their own networks um, now that this barrier has been removed but hopefully it doesn't end just in August 3rd um, and so with that uh, you know uh, the the call that uh, Roberto really uh, brought forth of like, this is all hands on deck, right? We are having this conversation because not everyone has internet service um, and it hurts, it shows. <laughs> the lack of investment has shown. And, and so now we're trying to figure out, okay, um, how do we provide service in the immediate, um, you know, in, in the immediate moment to make sure people stay connected, um, but, I want to pose this one last question to all of you um, about this is this as Roberto, um, you know, pointed out means also thinking um, about all of the efforts um, that we should take uh, as broadband advocates as as members of rural native communities in the middle and long term. So I want you to uh, give us your pitch for one uh, policy uh, that you want uh, advocates to champion or that you want people to really pay attention to, not because it's going to create um, connection in the immediate, but because it's something that we need to plan to so that we're not in the situation uh, when the next pandemic hits, because it likely will. So what is your pitch for the policy that advocates of rural and native communities should look out for uh, to make sure that internet service is deployed in our communities? Right now, I would say that for Indian country, my one pitch, if everybody can get on the horn, is to urge the FCC to allow all tribes to use 2.5 gigahertz um, right now, today. Thanks, Loris. Anybody want to follow up with their one pitch or should I call on names? Well, I, I, my pitch is more of a personal action than it is a policy statement. Uh, Roberto mentioned the need to do some crowdsourcing. I would absolutely encourage everyone to download the Test It app. Um, Test It is something uh, the promoted by the National Association of Counties, Rural Lisk, a few others. This is something, an app you can download on your phone, on your iPad, whatever, and test the speed where you are. I would encourage everyone to download that and then use it everywhere. Check it in your kitchen, check it in your basement, check it in the front of the room, check it in the back of the room, check it at 10 a.m., check it at 1 p.m., check it at work, check it at your neighbors, check it everywhere. Every time you run the speed test on that app, that data goes back to a central location and helps the map where the needs are. Uh, I think I'm next. Uh, my final pitch would be uh, focus on quality, not quantity. And uh, what I mean with this is many networks that are being funded today uh, more than likely will be obsolete in 10 years when they're done building. Um, it's time to look and drive our cars, our communities through our, our windshield and not our rear view mirror. I think that it's uh, very, very important that we 
are aware and plan and fund networks that will be able to sustain the demand uh, by the time they're done. And unfortunately, we're looking through our rear view mirror and by the time, and then I don't think that'll lead us anywhere positive for, for rural and urban. So that would be my, my one pitch. Uh, it's very hard for me to pick just one <laughs> as, as the uh, DC policy person on this, <laughs> on this webinar. You know, I think I'm gonna go back to really collecting better data about where broadband is and isn't available, how much that broadband costs and how well it works. I think without that information, we're just not in a position to know what we need to do moving forward. And then, you know, there's more wonky recommendations I could make um, about the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund and how it's not giving funding to areas that are receiving, because I'm sneaking into here, because um, they're um, not giving money to areas that are receiving Department of Agriculture funds or state funding. Um, and it's expensive to build these networks. And, you know, oftentimes multiple sources of funding are going to be needed. And so, you know, also kind of, working um, to make sure that the FCC gives funding where it's going to be helpful for deployment in addition to collecting better data. Um, and last but not least, um, as, a, um, as a former educator, I taught elementary school before law school. Um, education is near and dear to my heart, which is one of the reasons that E-rate is near and dear to my heart. Uh, so my ask would be uh, take a serious look at E-rate not just stopgap measures, um, but a serious look at E-rate because this isn't gonna be, this, is, this uh, pandemic is not gonna end uh, necessarily. It, I, I think education has fundamentally changed and, and will change going forward. So we need to be prepared. And so what can we do to ensure that students can learn no matter where they are? They can learn at school, they can learn at home. And what can we do to strengthen and leverage the E-rate program to make sure the children can learn and community members um, can learn no matter where they are. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, um, panelists, for these amazing recommendations and for your uh, sharing with us your expertise on this uh, pretty wonky <laughs> set of issues. You know, we asked you to come prepared to dive into uh, some obscure programs to the rest of the country. You all are broadband uh, experts, so you know them inside and out. And um, to help us figure out how to move forward as advocates um, that want to ensure that rural and native communities are connected. And as uh, you know, Roberto put it well, like not looking towards, uh, not looking through a rear view mirror, not even to parallel park, right? But to, um, to really look forward um, and make sure that the networks we build are um, meet the, uh, exp the expectations of people once they are built. Um, thank you so much for participating, uh, for joining us in the second conversation. The National Rural Assembly and the Daily Yonder um, hosted the second Rural Conversations, um, but uh, they're preparing more conversations for all of you listeners and everyone that's joined us today. Um, we will make the, the recording available for this um, uh, for this panel tomorrow on the Rural Assembly website. And we wanna hear from you, what other conversations are you interested in? What other topics are you interested in, in exploring in terms of rural communities and COVID and beyond? So go to the Rural Assembly website and take that, um, you know, give us feedback in that survey. Um, and I also wanna say that, you know, the work that, I mean, the, the recommendations and the insight that uh, the panelists today shared with us is going to be shared with everyone who joined and via the Rural Assembly and the Daily Yonder. So keep checking back in and thank you so much guys for joining us. We really appreciate your expertise and insights and encouragement. So take care. Thanks all. Thank you.